So um, I'm going to talk today about um, doing spatial range queries in Python and memory, a very, very specific topic. Um, I wrote a couple of month blog posts about it, um, uh, how uh, we actually made it possible to do all this stuff in Python and memory uh, with the use of some standard libraries. And I actually have to, uh, three, actually three objectives for this talk today. Uh, first of all, I want each and everybody to understand what a spatial range query is. Uh, I mean, who worked before with some spatial data? Maybe a quick show of hands. Okay, now I have to, to be, be smart enough to tell something stupid. Um, who knows what a spatial range query pretty much is? Okay, perfect. Um, and um, other one, otherwise, I want to know what kind of alternatives you have when, you, when you're facing this issue. So, um, actually, it's not the only way to solve. There are probably billions of libraries, billions of options. Um, uh, of solving this problem. And of course, um, I want you to understand that you can actually um, produce this, actually six lines of Python code, uh, such a index on your, on your own. So talking about the problem, hitting objective one. Um, we are at um, having getting pretty much a couple of hundred million location events every day. Um, we actually want to give um, this data some dimensionality, some additional information, and therefore, we, we assign to those events uh, points of interest. Uh, what is a point of interest? Is everything. It can be a bar. It can be a, an ATM. Um, it can be I don't know. Pretty much anything. A park bench is also a point of interest. Apparently, um, we are expect, expecting this from OpenStreetMap and have roughly for Germany 1.567 million point of interest there. And now the objective is pretty much for each and every event get the stuff for a window that are nearby. I mean, this little plot here, actually also folio, very nice tool, it can be recommended, um, is actually showing this one here. Um, now, the, the certain issue um, that we are facing is that you want to get for every event a list of point of interest that are within this range. Sounds easy, doesn't it? And uh, why is this guy following this boring talk here? Um, but it's actually not that easy if you need to do it millions of times a day. Um, what kind of alternatives do you have when you take such an issue? Um, most of you probably work with Postgres, or some of you have worked with Postgres. They have a really amazing um, spatial indexing uh, tool, which is called Postgres, and it's also community curated. Um, each and every one technique is probably having a Postgres database at hand. Use Postgres SQL, Postgres index, if you don't facing millions of queries a day. It's really an amazing tool, I really, really recommend it. Also, MongoDB, maybe for people who come more from a web development side, um, uh, have, has some spatial indexing capabilities, also very neat spatial um, query uh, capabilities, uh, really nice stuff. But there's also this third option, where, um, so trust me, I'm Andy, I can build this on my own. Uh, and this is probably what I want to talk uh, to you um, about today, because we apparently didn't have the chance for this use case to use um, the alternatives right there and they also ended up to be too slow as you can see here. Um, let's say we need to do 100 million of the spatial range trees a day. I mean we have 40 hours of data and we should finish within 40, 40 hours of data, uh, 40 hours a day because if not we will never finish uh, processing. Let's assume we have something like 50 milliseconds which is already uh, probably a worst case estimate of most risk and you need to do every single query on its own. And uh, then you end up that you have something like with a parent of 40, if you are post business and this can stand it all the time, it's also a question, uh, have something like 35 hours of processing time. And that's quite a gap of 11 hours, which shows that we actually can't have a problem here. Of course, now everybody thinks, okay, let's optimize it, let's batch the queries, create some temp table workarounds. Yeah, we didn't want to use this complexity here. Um, because, we want to build it on our own. Um, what kind of ingredients do you need to have when you build your own fast range query tool? Um, you need to have some data where to make the range queries on. Um, this is pretty much what all the data looks like. Um, I didn't check the latitude longitude, so most of us is probably not there, but um, somewhere else. And now the magical ingredient to this entire equation of the index. I mean, everyone who probably did ever something with database engineering. Uh, knows that the index is usually the one that makes the stuff fast, if not the data organization itself. And this, what we aim for is moonshot, rocket, fast, 
period time in milliseconds areas in memory. As mentioned, uh, we will talk about this index part today. Um, and when you Google spatial index, um, this is pretty much what pops up. Um, you have, uh, have different options, and what all, what all that try pretty much to do, and what the basic characteristic, characteristic of an index is, is that you pretty much want to um, minimize the amount of uh, computations you want to do. I mean, if I have two million uh, points of interest in my database, of course I can every request uh, calculate the distance to every to every point. But this is two million calculations that are uh, given query, and this does not scale at all. This is why you should organize your data. Better, and this is what the index is pretty much about. Um, here you have something in R3. Uh, probably a lot of you know this already, and this is pretty much as in the name, the rectangle uh, tree, which organizes all the data points into rectangles and structure them within a, uh, within a tree, pretty much. And by this, when you now have a query, which is a rectangle, give me well, the rectangle can really easily traverse this tree and then retrieve these data points. Um, the ball tree. Um, is something that actually is similar, um, but organizes the data within spheres, balls, 3D balls, spheres. Um, also in a hierarchical way. And then we come up with an option here um, about geo hashes. Um, we are Venus right now very excited about geo hashes because it's a tool which we just discovered a couple of months ago. Um, very, very nice uh, stuff. Um, there's actually a, um, a formula where you can um, uh, pretty much um, yeah, this, uh, partition the entire globe space within a grid of, of brackets, squares, pretty much. And they have a certain uh, precision, so um, they can be, this is I think precision 8 or something, and this is like as an as a error of at least 250 meters around. And this makes it really easy for you to access this data and organize your data within the GeoMesh. We will today focus on those two, the ball tree, and how to use geohashes to also make this indexing happen. Um, okay, what is a ball tree? Um, I don't want to do this at university lecture, but just some basic stuff. Um, the ball tree is a binary tree, so it splits twice uh, on every leaf, uh, leaf on every node. Um, and uh, as you can see here, do you actually see the Yes. Um, that this is a top level, and then it organizes the data into two different spheres, top level. Then each of the spheres is split again, and so on and so forth, that you end up here in this example with eight spheres. Um, due to this very neat, spherical structure of data, it's a perfect fit for H trees. Because imagine a point and radius, easy fit. Um, how does now a um, ball tree uh, traverse during, some, during, future seven, during the query time? I mean, you have the top level, um, and you would first of all check if is your is your sphere apparently in the in your global sphere. If not, then you don't need pursuit. So then you have pretty much one comparison. You know, I have no data instead of comparing two million different examples with each other. Um, so level two would be then something okay. I detect I'm within the sphere, then go deeper within the sphere, and here I set up I traverse the tree until the end, uh, and I know that I'm here. And I have now done seven comparisons, if I'm right, um, to actually get my data points out of this. Uh, and comparison to two million, this is quite an advantage. Of course, our ball tree is a bit deeper um, than this one, but uh, it gives you, gives you a picture. And now comes the neat part, it's almost for free. Um, you can, uh, with uh, Linsight Learn, they have a ball tree implementation, uh, which allows you to use um, hand sign distance, uh, which is usually used when you compare uh, kind of the distances over the globe. Um, and I mean, here, this is pretty much building the index, uh, and this is pretty much the crew. So, uh, a couple of lines of code, and you have this index done. Bam. Um, this is so, this also stress, I, I'm always amazed what a nice piece of software um, as per especially the ball trees implemented in C, so it's also amazing fast. Um, Okay, all three done. Let's move to GeoHash. Um, who knows about the concept of GeoHashes? Maybe a picture of hands again? Okay, so I hope that I get this perfect. Um, because it's uh, really one of the If you work with spatial data, especially you want to group uh, spatial data, uh, this is, in my opinion, the, the way to go for now. Um, and GeoHash is pretty much a, a structure um, which subdivides the, the space into, into a bucket of grid shape. 
So here you have uh, obviously Northern America, um, not American apparently right now, but um, uh, and you see here that this has a certain hash value. This hash value is pretty much a, uh, I think from 1 to 12 uh, long uh, base 32 value uh, representing this area. And if you know decode the latitude and longitude, the fourth or the now, the geo hasher will give you this geo hash. Actually, so similar data points get similar hashes. That's pretty much the intuition you have. Um, also, when you then drill down, you can see that all, all Um, so when you drill down, um, that you apparently have all the geohashes have exactly the same prefix. So this is very neat if you want to search neighbors and all that stuff. So um, and this actually with very neat drill down pattern allows you to to vary in uh, geohash resolutions quite quickly, and then also get points that are nearby without needing to calculate all the time the distance. And this is what we make use of. Um, here's a um, Spatial query, pretty much what you around the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, so you want to have your interest within this, uh, all part of interests within the screen circle view. Um, what you do, uh, what we do at index times, we organize all the data points, all the point of interest that we have uh, within um, the geohash. So we have pretty much a big dict geohash list of data points. Um, and when you now at uh, query time want to get the ready to first of all get all the geohashes. Um, Geo hashes within this, uh, this radius, and then you can approximate this radius quite good. So then retrieving all the points, having a list of points, and afterwards you can then on this very small candidate subset form a good so, uh, force search again because you prune basically within this uh, methods within a couple of uh, milliseconds your search base uh, indefinitely. Um, here the implementation is a bit uh, more complex. Um, I didn't let runner into on top of this, so um, excuse my, my bad patterns side here. Um, so uh, what you would see that you have also index time, which is building pretty much the index, and then later on you retrieving your candidate set, and then pretty much filtering afterwards because you're using uh, you're calculating again the pairwise uh, distances to the to your query. So far so good. We have two indices. Uh, let's see how fast it is or if I spend just an afternoon um, uh, wasting my time. Uh, here, we actually want to compare also against the baseline. So we have the ball tree, which is uh, our implemented index, the GFN, and then just the brute force approach. It would be this calculating every single time the distance to 2 million data points. So um, here, um, what you see is the brute force approach. This one, um, I actually didn't use logarithmic scales to make a point. Um, so, I don't blame you. Um, you see that in comparison to brute force, you, we are with, all, with both implemented process totally outperforming. But this is nothing unexpected. I mean, if there would be something close to brute force, then you would have done something completely wrong. Zooming now in a bit, um, what you actually see um, is that you have still some kind of a linearish growth as, as bigger as. Um, the database of samples grows the longer the query takes, but I mean, if anybody worked ever with big Postgres tables, also on the biggest database, the index doesn't fit anymore. Uh, doesn't, doesn't fix it in the end anymore. Um, and then you see here the average query time kind of milliseconds. And when you look at it, it's single digits. So we pretty much achieved our goal that we have a faster than Postgres index, um, all in memory. Also, when we need, when we aim now, we have roughly one million uh, POIs, and then we have. According to which you need to do something in query time between 1.5 and 3.5 seconds. Adding up the numbers again, I'm already coming <laughs> to a conclusion. Um, let's say we have again, uh, we take out the ball tree, the worst case performance, um, having 100 million queries again, then we end up with a comparison of 40 within 2.1 hours of processing time, which is something you can actually live with and which we live now every day with. Um, but of course, there are, um, there are downsides. Um, you, need to, you need to create this index on the bottom. When you have Postgres, you create your Postgres index at once and there, done. Uh, don't need to care anymore about it. Um, we need, every time we start our workers, first of all, index all the data that we have, and then keep the data in memory, the index pretty much in memory. Uh, this costs a lot of memory, or not a lot of memory, it's actually quite, quite low on memory consumption, especially if you use the SKLearn Baltry implementation. Um, 
what I again want to stress is that um, even though we're also doing a lot of machine learning, and there will come more machine learning talks, or more machine learning talk today, um, SK Learn has so much, many good functionality that you can use it for a lot of different use cases. Uh, it's really something uh, I can really recommend uh, looking at. And also, what we learned a lot at Minos, I mean, I think my colleagues can say yes, that also big data needs often big problems. Um, I, I see a lot of learning here. If you have need to process a couple of hundred gigabytes a day, um, standard solutions often fail, and you need to think uh, your way around it. And um, also, uh, something if your database, due to some weird reason, uh, doesn't support any any geospatial uh, indexing features, you still can use this kind of uh, stuff here. So um, we, uh, of course, have been able to use Vertica for. Um, for some of the some of our data processing parts, and they you know, have a good geospatial uh, support, and therefore we simply need to do it on our own. That's it from my side. Thank you very much, and of course we are hiring also. <laughs> uh, if you're interested.